Father, we're so grateful that we get to come together, God, as your people. We're so grateful, Lord, for all you do for us. Father, we are not to be terrified by these rumors of things, by these viruses and things going on around us. Yes, we're careful. We're washing our hands. We're taking all precautions. But God, to be terrified like the rest of the world, like the poor man, just recently, the other day, drove into the healthcare parking lot, as Pat was saying, blew his brains out. God, this world is full of people with no hope because they do not know you, Jesus Christ. They are terrified, but not us. We have the truth, the true gospel of you, Jesus Christ, the only message that has the power to save. Help us to be bold and faithful in sharing that, in preaching Christ, Lord, to a lost and dying world. Thank you so much for saving us, God, for opening our hearts and our minds to the truths, for opening our eyes, God. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us of all sins. Right now, God, we lay our sins, we lay anything that happened this week at your feet, Jesus, because we want to come to you cleansed, purified, holy before you, praising you, God, with our hearts, soul, minds, and with our strength. So please, God, accept this time of worship as acceptable unto you, and receive it, please, Lord, as, as the, 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 the sweet-smelling aroma, God. We praise you, Lord, and we give you all thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. This first song is called, We Preach Christ. Kind of goes along with what's going on, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, come on, this is the only message that saves. So, as you know, our, you know the band's got the week off. We don't have a band, but anyway, <laughs> we do have the Lord and we do have technology, which helps out. So it's called We Preach Christ.
Is that wonderful or what? That is just an, wow, couldn't believe that. Great song, awesome, awesome stuff. Of course, now everybody knows this next one. Alrighty.
<laughs> yeah, that was uh, pretty wild, guys. Good job there on the uh, worship uh, this morning. Yeah, absolutely. Sounded great. Praise God. Uh, pretty awesome stuff, huh? Pretty awesome stuff. All right, we're going we're to take this moment right now to go ahead and, and uh, pass the basket around for our offering. So I'll be coming around with that now from six feet away, of course. <laughs> Paper airplanes, however you want to do it, is good with me. All righty. Okay. All right. And bring the camera back in. Good. <laughs> kind of doing, uh, kind of working the tech as well this morning, so bear with me as we multitasking, but <laughs> praise God. Uh, Thanks, brother. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, so that was great. Now, meet and greet as we get ready to get started. Let's go ahead and look at everybody, look at somebody, check out, look at your neighbor and turn to someone and say, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Who's Jesus? Who is Jesus? What? Who is Jesus? Well, praise God, he is who he says he is. And he tells us that, and he's going to show us that through his word. Lord willing today, but uh, before we get started, let's go ahead and let's, uh, let's open up in prayer. Father, we thank you for, God, just wonderful worship music, Lord, that we get to sing praises to you, God, uh, sing praises to who you are, your very attributes, your nature, your character, who you are, God, is holy, 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 God, it is who you are, Lord, and we, we thank you so much, Father, that you're gracious and merciful, God, for who are we that you are mindful of us, Lord? We are, we are mere wretched peasants, God, but you're so good that you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, to redeem a lost and dying mankind because of your love, God, because you are love. That is true love. You didn't just say it, you did it. You demonstrated it, God. Not based on us or anything about us, based on your character and your love, God. And we're so thankful that you would save us, Lord, through Jesus Father, we just give you all the praise this morning. We ask, God, that you would guide this study this morning, God, that you would open our hearts and our minds to the very truths of your word, and Lord, that you would help us to come to know you more through the preaching of your word, God. Please, we need to hear from you today. God, we also pray for so many out there who are just terrified because of everything going on around us, God. We pray that the church will be the church and stand up. Jesus said... When you hear of wars and disturbances or rumors of wars, do not be terrified. Well, this is war against a virus. And what are we to do? Run to the hills, freak out, pull out our hair? No. Stand firm, be bold, be smart, right? As you tell us, Jesus, we are among the wolves, sheeps among the wolves, God. Please use us in a mighty way. Help us to understand and open our minds in our eyes to see wonderful things this morning. We praise you and we lift all this to you in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. It is a great and wonderful priv privilege that we get to continue together in our study of God's word, correct? Yes. What a great privilege that is, that we get to come together and open God's word, right? We're studying prophecy in the light of end times. Hey, pretty cool, huh? We have been looking at the last sermon of our Lord, known as the Olivet Discourse, that is, Jesus' teaching on the Mount of Olives. We know that this was brought on by the disciples' questions that they asked the Lord after he informed them that the temple in Jerusalem, all the buildings, and even Jerusalem itself were going to be destroyed, that not even one stone would be left upon another. Now, we've dealt with this every week. I'm not going to belabor this point. I think we get it. Well, this triggered the disciples to ask specific questions that our Lord Jesus then gives them answers to. He answers them in a way that requires some thought on their part and ours, right? He doesn't answer them in order. They asked him a time. When is a time? What does he do? He doesn't answer it as, well, you know, in you know, a few years down the road, 2,000 years. They didn't see that coming. So in the first answer, their questions would have definitely had them wondering. 
But to refresh our memories here, let's turn together to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verses 4 through 6, again real quick, just to refresh our memories of Jesus' first answer to their questions. Again, I don't want to belabor the point of the questions. We dealt with that every week, so I think we get it. Okay, but, but in verse 4, he says, he says this, right, to the answer their questions. And Jesus answered and said to them what? Hey, I'll tell you when this is going to happen, guys. I'll tell you exactly when. No, he doesn't say that, does he? What does he say? See to it that no one misleads you, no one deceives you, no one carries you away with false teaching. Why? For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. Now again, just to refresh our minds here, this is what his first answer to their questions are. You know, real quick, tell us, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming? What will be the sign of the end of the age? We so a fourth question there in Mark and Luke. But besides that, his answer is just see to it, that is to be watchful, take heed, be always watching for what? That no one deceives you, okay? Uh, again, we dealt with this last week under the caption of deception, deception. Take heed that no man deceive you. Why, Jesus? Why? Is this so important right here? Why? He tells him because many will come in my name saying what? I am the Christ. Wait, I am the Christ. I represent the true Christ through my religious system. And they shall what? Deceive many. I am Christ. I am the Christ. I represent the true Christ through my religious system, if you will. We could expand on that. What has gone on since then? Oh, all kinds of stuff. We saw the guys these days claiming to be literally Christ. They're lunatics. These people, these are deceivers, right? They're going to deceive many. These are deceivers. These are liars who are of their father, the devil, right? Where does lie come from? It originates from who? Not God, from Satan, right? They're liars who are of their father, the devil, who is a liar. As Jesus went on and he taught and he rebuked the religious leaders of that day, he called them out as they truly are, that is, of the devil, this was the world's largest religious system at that time. What's the world's largest religious system of this day? That's, don't, what, what do you have to say about that? What, they're Christians too. No, far from it. So far from it, it's not even funny. They're nothing more than a spinoff of first century apostate, wicked Judaism. And yes, boldly I do say that. Absolutely. Absolutely. These are deceivers and liars. They are of their father, the devil. What does Jesus say about them? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you what he says about them. John 8, 44, he says, you, you wicked Pharisees, Sadducees, you wicked religious people of the day are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. What does that mean? Adam and Eve. God said, no, if you eat of the fruit, surely you will die. Satan says, no, no, no. Surely you will not die. He was a murderer from the beginning. Now, praise God, because he's gracious and merciful. They didn't die right away, and the whole thing destroyed. God would have been just and righteous if he would have done that. He didn't. We see grace, right? He's a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Guess what? Whenever he speaks a lie, you know what he's doing? He speaks from his own nature. Why? For he is a liar and the father of lies. Hmm, interesting, interesting. Any person, any group of people, any religious organization, any that claim to know the Christ or to have the right way and get Jesus wrong will die in their sins and will face the eternal punishment of hell, which is a place of eternal separation from God, of eternal conscious torment, a place where Jesus said the worm never dies. The smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever if you get Jesus wrong. Jesus was very clear in how serious this is that we know him and that we truly believe that he is who he said he is. Folks, this is not a joke. This is not a game. This is not a matter of religion. This is simply, this is not a matter of 
Today's big one. But I'm a good person. This is not a matter of being a good person, for there are what? Romans 3. There are none who are good, not even one. Not even one is good. This is a matter of knowing Jesus Christ and believing that he is who he said he is. The Christ, the Messiah, the one who came to save his people from their sins. Again, this is serious. Getting this wrong is a matter of eternity. We're all going to die. Okay, just shocker, everybody here, you're going to die. I'm going to die. We're all going to die, okay? That is guaranteed. Guess how many people out of how many people die? 100 out of 100 people die. Guaranteed, proven. Guaranteed, absolutely. 100 out of 100 people guaranteed will die. Jesus Christ will determine where you spend eternity. But enough of that. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. We're going to read a big chunk here, but we're going to deal with a small portion. I want to kind of deal with the context here. John chapter 8. We're going to start there in verse 12, and we're going to continue on in this. Who is Jesus? And man, you want to talk about a sermon? You want to talk about evangelism? Here it is right here. Here it is right here. Jesus, the greatest teacher, preacher, evangelist of all time. Jesus Christ. If you're there, let me go ahead and get a hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. All right, I'll take it. Let's go ahead and start at verse 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Here's one of the I am statements. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So, of course, here they come. Here they come. The Pharisees said to him, you're testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. You you can almost hear the sarcasm. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. Even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. Old Testament law, two or three or more. That's where that comes from, by the way. We are talking about that earlier. Even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, where is your father? Hmm. Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Ooh. I mean, if you get Jesus wrong, you get it all wrong? Oh, yeah. Yeah. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. There's God's sovereignty. They wanted to kill him. Then he said again to them, I go away, and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. That's harsh words, right? So the Jews were saying, of course, they were so smart, high and mighty with their tassels and things hanging from their robes. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. Miss the whole point again. All together. All together. Blind guides, you serpents. He was saying to them, you are from below. How about that? How many preachers are out there today calling out the wicked religious system and telling them who they really are by nature? Catholic Church, you are from below. You heretics, Seventh-day Adventists, you are from below. Jehovah's Witness, you are from below. Mormons, you're really from below. You are from below. I'm just repeating the words of my Lord and Savior. And as Tim says all the time, a servant is not greater than his master, as the Bible says. A servant is not greater than his master. Who am I to say, well, we just got to love. You can't do that. Yeah. No, yes, you can. Why? For the sake of the saints. 
for the sake of the people who do not know, for the sake of those who are caught in this. I mean, there's testimonies of Catholics who have come out and their biggest fit is this. Why aren't you preaching on this? I was headed to hell. And if not for the grace of God, somebody had the guts to say something. And I got saved out of this. Why aren't you saying anything? Because maybe you're feasting at the table of demons. Anyway. Verse 24, it says this, uh, verse 23, and he was saying to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You ready for this? All this, and you know what they say? Who are you? They were saying to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. Jesus does not speak on his own accord. He speaks from what the Father gives him. He is God. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. You know what the result, you hear this, right? Right? You know what the result of this was? Verse 30. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. What? I'm telling you, we've got evangelism upside down. We try to appeal to people's sinfulness. We try to encourage them. If you just repeat after me, guess what? I was in sales. I can get anybody just about to repeat after me a prayer. That does not save them. Preach Christ, preach Christ. So, now if we were to compare Jesus' sermon here to what is called evangelism today, we would have some serious problems. Now, what's the difference? The big difference is this. He wasn't out there trying to, what was he? He was speaking the truth about who he is. What happened? Verse 30, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. It just, just, down a little further, he says, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Wow. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, praise God, right? Now, now, many people came to believe in him. Why? Because he promised them their best life now. No. Because he promised them health and wealth. No. Because he promised them that all their problems would just... Isn't that the big one, though? Just accept Jesus into your heart, and you'll have the greatest life. All your problems will go away. Man, and then sow a seed into my ministry. Sow a seed uh, into... Charlatan, heretic, blab it, grab it, name it, claim it, false prophets, claiming they are of the Christ, heretics. Because he explained to them that unless they believe that he is who he says he is, They will die in their sins. How's that for a sermon? Verse 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, I am, you will die in your sins. I don't know if you guys paid attention to the emphasis I put on that. I don't know if you realize that the word he there in your translation is in italics. All right? It's in italics. That word is not in the original manuscripts. That word, again, all good. That word was added in our translations for a better reading of the text. It was added for the reader, okay? This was common in translating from one language to another, okay? So it was added. That's why it's in italics. It wasn't there. What Jesus is telling these people is, I am. I am. When Jesus is telling them, what, what Jesus is telling them is that unless they believe that he is the I am, they will die in their sins. Well, this kind of brings us to our first point on who is Jesus. Now, this, we've got a lot of points to go. We're going to get one today. 
one today because this one, and we're just barely scratching the surface, clawing at the surface of Scripture just to get this because there's so much. But this brings us to our first point is who is Jesus, right? Who is Jesus? Well, it's, of course, is always a great question. I'm glad you asked. It shows that you're, you're, you're paying attention. It shows that you're awake. It shows that, hey, man, a lot of things. So based on this passage right here, with Jesus' very own words, we're going to look at who Jesus is. But first, I want to do this. What does he say? Jesus said to them, unless you believe. Unless you believe. Okay? Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. I want to deal with that. I want to deal with that because is it possible that there are people who believe that who truly aren't saved? (laughs) People who believe and so. Yeah. The demons believe. You know what's different about the demons and these heretics? The demons tremble. Oh, Oh, my goodness. This, Jesus emphasizes as the fatal, unforgivable, 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 and eternal sin. Okay, this goes right along with what we're saying. The failure to believe in Jesus Christ as who he is, the Messiah, the Son of God, God, this will get you a one-way ticket straight to hell. Okay, this is the one thing that casts all men into hell in the lake of fire is not believing in Jesus. It's the one thing that will keep you from being with him for all eternity. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ, you're headed to hell, straight headed to hell. This is why Paul says, as our song went, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Right? Paul's own words. Yet this is the only message that has the power to save. Anything else is a false presentation of the true gospel and of who Jesus Christ really is. Even when they blasphemed the Holy Spirit, it was because, remember the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? They attributed the works of the Holy Spirit to who? To Beelzebub, to Satan, right? Even when they blasphemed the Holy Spirit, it was because they didn't believe who Jesus Christ said He is, and they attributed his miracles to the power of Satan. Still, a disbelief rooted in the very deadly denying of Jesus Christ. They denied who Jesus Christ was, therefore they attributed his miracles to Satan. Wow. That was the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The only thing you will not be pardoned of and forgiven of today is your disbelief in Jesus Christ. If you truly believe in who he is. We're going to get to that, though, because again... so. Though all other sins be pardoned when repented of, this sin of disbelief will send you straight to hell. That's a harsh claim, right? No, not really. Not if you know who Jesus is. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who have this preconceived idea of who Jesus is, and they find themselves, you know, who knows how many times a week, uh, partaking in transubstantiation, which is a Catholic practice of somehow, you know, turning wine and crackers into the blood and body of Jesus Christ, re-crucifying the Lord of glory all over again? Oh, that's such a blaspheme. Oh, that is horrible. And these people will say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Well then, with this, 75% of America believes in Jesus, right? Which means we're all going to heaven, right? Hey, praise God for that. That's a great point, Tim. I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you uh, pointed that out to us, because that's pretty much, I think, the statistic today is that 75% of Americans say they believe in Jesus Christ, right? Thanks for bringing that up. Can someone say they believe in Jesus, know the Bible, and still not be saved? Matthew 24, 4 and 5, and Jesus said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many, right? First off, I just always want to be clear. I didn't say it. Jesus did. I didn't say it. Jesus did. Second off, yes, many not only can but will say they believe in Jesus and will be liars and deceive many. And not only that, the others will just be plain deceived by these liars and deceivers, and they will be deceiving one another. Right? This is where our Greek studies come in handy. The Greek word here for believe is 
pistuo, pistuo, right? This is more than just saying, I believe. Believe what? What do you believe? That's the question, right? I believe that Jesus really walked the earth. Does that save you? Many believe that. I believe that Jesus was a good teacher. In fact, <laughs> he was a great teacher. I believe he was even greater than Buddha or Muhammad. Right? Does that save you? I believe in Jesus. I said a prayer once at a tent revival meeting, and the guy said that if I repeat after him, that I'll be saved. I checked that box. I marked that off in my life. I did that number nine on my bucket list. Does that save you? Some would say that Jesus is a myth. They would say that he's a copy of the pagan gods of other ancient religions. They believe in him. Does that save you? Some would say that they believe in Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. And as you're talking to him, they would say that Jesus is Michael, the archangel. Eh, wrong. Some would say they believe in Jesus and that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer who was just dealt a better hand. Eh, wrong. And today, among professing, professing, professing evangelical Christians, Jesus is just one of many ways to heaven. They believe in Jesus, though, right? You've got your, your, your spiritists, you've got your uh, mythicists, You've, you've got your Oprah Wan Kenobis, as Pastor Billy calls them. You've got your, your you know, Roma Downies who, who do movies about Jesus, but who are, who are entrenched in New Age. You know what Roma Downey's husband said about her? She's so spiritual, she floats. Okay. Oh, and by the way, she did a movie called The Acts, or The Apostles or something of that nature, about Acts. Oh, and there was a workbook to that movie. By the way, with all due respect, you know who put out the workbook? Boy, I'll tell you what. David Jeremiah. Absolutely. Brother David, I surely hope you're there to witness and bring people to Christ. But on the other hand, that's kind of the same table with demons. Just saying. Call it as you see it, right? Again, today among... Professing evangelical Christians, Jesus is just one of many ways to heaven. There's many ways. No, you're, you're, you're very exclusive. You're mean. You're intolerant. Well, yeah, but I follow after my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. With all due respect, this is just a few. This is merely a very small pond in a sea of heresies, okay? A very small pond in a sea of heresies. There's so many more, and all of these would say that they believe in Jesus, but when it comes down to it, all of these are headed straight to hell. I'm not going to pull any punches. I'm not going to say, well, maybe you know, they'll find the way along the way. No, you're right now, if this is you, headed straight to hell, period. And if you don't repent and get right with Jesus Christ, the true Jesus Christ, the one revealed in Scripture, you're headed to hell. Oh, and by the way, you've been warned. Because I'm mean? No, because I love you enough to tell you the truth. I'm not going to sit there and butter you up and say, hey, you're doing great, brother. Praise God. You're, you're almost there. Yeah, we'll get you there. No, only Jesus can get you there. But there's some things. So to answer the question, can someone believe in Jesus and not truly be saved? Yeah, all over the place. Because their belief is not based on who Jesus said he is, but on a Jesus who is not the Jesus of the Bible. <clears throat> the Jesus that is preached today in many circumstances, isn't biblical. What they have done is they have taken a piece of the pie and ran with it. It's all or none. All. You can't pull his attributes apart and, and create your own idol. That's called idolatry, by the way. So this brings us back to our Greek word for believe, which is pistuo. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words says this, Pistuo is this, to believe, but also to be persuaded of, and hence to place confidence in. This is to believe so to the point of full confidence in, okay? To trust, and this signifies in the sense of the word, reliance upon, not mere credence. In other words, I depend upon Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior each and every day. He is my Lord and my Savior. Not just, yeah, I believe in Jesus, and just be lackadaisical as most 
churches are today, unfortunately. This word is used all throughout the New Testament, but mostly in the writings of the Apostle John, especially in his gospel. In his gospel, John uses this verb 99 times. Wow, 99 times in the Gospel of John. Matthew uses the verb 10 times, Mark 10 times, and Luke 9 times. John uses this verb 99 times, again, dealing with believing. The one Gospel that emphasizes the person of Jesus Christ, right? The Gospel of John. Who is Jesus Christ? That's where we get the I am statements. The one gospel that emphasizes the person of Jesus Christ uses this verb, pistuo, which is believe, 99 times. Boy, and if God didn't try to tell you once, twice, three times, a lady, boy, he told you 99 times. 99 times. And they say, but God, I didn't know. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Again, you've been warned. This is to believe, to commit, to entrust, and to trust. This is to place your full confidence in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, trusting in His works alone on the cross for your salvation. This trusting is saving faith. And this, too, a gift from God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths straight. Trust in the... This is placing your full confidence in, because there is no other way. There is no other way. He is the way. But what did Jesus say, though? Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. This was very clear to who Jesus was claiming to be. He said clearly, unless you believe that I am. But just to be a little more clear, John 8, 58 and 59 says this. Jesus said to them, again, the Pharisees, religious people, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Hey, man, thank you so much for telling me, Jesus. Praise God, I get it. No, what's the next verse? Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Hard-hearted, obstinate people, seeing that you will not perceive. Remember, we dealt with Isaiah last week. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting. This brings us again to our first point. First point, this. Jesus is God. That is Yahweh. One guy writes this. Our text reads, I am he. The word he is not part of the original statement. Jesus' words were not constructed normally, but were influenced by Old Testament Hebrew usage. So in other words, it wasn't just a normal construction of language, if you will, of literature, as we would know a normal construction of literature, but it didn't have to be because its influence came straight out of the Old Testament Hebrew usage of the words, right? Right? And again, you you translate that through the Septuagint Septuagint from Hebrew to Greek. There you go. And then from Greek into English and so on and so forth, you you get the adage. But it says this, it is an absolute usage meaning. I am and has immense theological significance. The reference may be to both Exodus 3.14, where the Lord declares his name as I am, and to Isaiah 40 through 55, where the phrase I am occurs repeatedly. In this, Jesus referred to himself as the God Yahweh. Yahweh, the Lord of the Old Testament, and directly claimed full deity for himself, prompting the Jews' question of verse 25. What was their question? So they were saying to him, Who are you? He just told them, For unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Turn with me to Exodus 3. Oh yeah, Old Testament. Here we go. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, 13 and 14. <clears throat> and again, this is a direct, um, directly from usage from the Old Testament directly claimed Jesus did full deity for himself. 
Exodus 3, 13 and 14 says this, Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am has sent me to you. God takes this very serious, by the way. I am who I am. And he says, I am has sent you. Now the question was not, who is this God? What did he say? What do I say? When they asked me, what do I say? The Hebrews understood the name Yahweh. This name had been known to the patriarchs, which Genesis well indicates. But what is his name? meant they sought for the relevancy of the name to their circumstances. I'll get to that. Who sought after title, name, and identity, whereas what inquired into the character, quality, or essence of a person? For instance, Abraham refers to God as Yahweh Jireh. You may have heard it as Jehovah Jireh, which didn't even turn into, we didn't even get the name Jehovah till the 1500s when the consonants and then the, the vowels and whatever were put together from, from Yahweh and Adonai, and they were put together by a scholar and came up with Jehovah. This is the 1500s. So, so, so much for Jehovah's Witnesses. We have the one true God, Jehovah. What, from the 1500s? I think we should get back to a first name basis, not a nickname. First name basis is Yahweh. <clears throat> so, instance, Abraham refers to God as Yahweh Jireh, which is what? The Lord will provide in verse 14. So, you may have heard this as Jehovah Jireh, but there's another story behind that, and we'll get to that, Lord willing, one day, just not today. There's, I'd love to get to that one day. We'll get to that one day. So Abraham refers to God as Yahweh Jireh, which simply means that God provides. God provides. Yahweh is who he is. Jireh is what he does or an aspect of his character or attributes. God is provider. That's the difference between who I am, who I am, and they ask, well, what do I say his name is? Not who is it? They knew who God was. They knew who Yahweh was, Right? <clears throat> in short, that is what's going on here. God says to Moses, I am who I am, right? And this deals with his name, strictly speaking, the only proper name for God, translated in English Bibles as Lord, all capitals, L-O-R-D. So the revelation of this name is given to Moses. I am who I am, Exodus 3.14. This name specifies an immediacy, a present, a presence, Okay, Yahweh is present, accessible, near to those who call on him for deliverance, for forgiveness, and for guidance. This is who Jesus said, I am. This is, it. not only that, Jesus is who we call on for what? Deliverance, forgiveness, and guidance. Same attributes, same characteristics. Another guy writes this, this name for God points to his self-existence and eternality. It denotes, I am the one who is, slash who will be, which is decidedly the best and most contextually suitable option from a number of theories about its meaning and the study of its origin and its very source. So now when Jesus says, I am, he is referring to his very nature as God, his very existence as God. Okay, Isaiah 43.10 says this, God is speaking to Israel, says that they are to be his witnesses. Says this, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that what? I am. I am he. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. And what is he doing? He's appealing to Israel for what? That they may know and believe and understand what was Jesus doing? He was fulfilling it, wasn't he? That they would, what? Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Isaiah 43, 13, even from eternity, I am he. And there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act, and who can reverse it? Obviously, rhetorical. No one, that's who. No one can ever reverse what God does. No one can ever hinder God's plan. And no one can ever thwart God's plan. And I mean, how many? None. 
No one. Does that include the coronavirus? Oh, man, I just don't know. If only I knew. I'm reading you scripture. I'm telling you, you can know and you do. Take heed, Christian, for God is the one who is causing all things to work together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. If you are in Christ and you belong to Christ, that means you. Hey, praise God, have a great day, right? So when Jesus says that you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins, he's pretty straightforward as to who he is. There's no pulling any punches, no doubt about it. They knew exactly what he was saying. And that's why on that last one, before Abraham was even born, I am, he said. And what happened? Well, they wanted to stone him to death, didn't they? But guess what? It wasn't his time. Clearly and unquestionably, I am is understood as God's name. Whenever Jesus made an I am statement in which he claimed attributes of deity, he was identifying himself as God. Now, there are many times Jesus does this, but mainly there is what is known as the seven I am statements. And John records these for us. And there's more in here, you know, but, but uh, the first one, Jesus said, I am the bread of life, right? John 6, 35, 6, 41, 48, and 51, okay? Jesus said, I am the light of the world, John 8, 12, and 9, 5. Jesus said, I am the door, John 10, 7, and 9. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, John 10, 11, and 14. Of course, this is also found in, guess where? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack any good thing, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, right? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, right? John eleven twenty five. 25. That's good news, by the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Of course, everybody's favorite, John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the true vine, John 15, 1 and 5. In every single one of these statements, Jesus is declaring himself as God, as Messiah, as the Savior, as the only one who has come to save and can save a lost mankind from their sin. <clears throat> so, who is Jesus? First answer, Jesus is God. He is the way, not a way, not a God as the Watchtower Society would try to get you to believe in their perversion of John 1.1, 1, 1, which states, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was a God. That is not what it says. That's a perversion. There is one true God. He exists in three personalities, Father, Son, and Spirit, period. Jesus is God. He is the way, not a way. He is not a God. He is the way. He is God. That is who Jesus is. Now, we can get a lot of things wrong, okay? In fact, as my and Tim's mentor, dear brother in Christ who went to be with the Lord, Dr. Morey, used to say, um, if your theology is not changing, you've stopped growing. Why? Because this is what I submit to. And as I grow, what I know changes to what this really says. That's all there is to it. We've all come into this relationship with uh, presuppositions and preconceived ideas of what we thought. I remember talking to Tim one day as we were going out to hand out tracts uh, a long time ago, and I'm, I was like in tears about it. Oh, God is so cool that he would just create everything and then just whew, step away and it still goes. That's a false teaching. I didn't know. I was ignorant of that. God is intimately acquainted. He sustains. He doesn't just back off and there it goes. That's a false teaching, by the way. I didn't know, but I was, I was excited about God and I was passionate about it. And I was just, just in awe of God. It, of course, bad theology. So, you know, as Dr. Moore used to say, you know, if your theology doesn't, isn't constantly changing, you know, uh, submitting itself to the Word of God, then you're not growing. You've stopped somewhere along the line, and you've, you've just you've stuck to it. You, you know, we're always changing. So now, we can get a lot of things wrong, but if you get this wrong, 
You're headed for a place of eternal conscious torment. And I care. So I'm going to tell you this. I don't care how good you think you are. I care. I don't care how many good works you've done and are doing because I care. I don't care how religious you are or think you are because I care. I don't care how often you attend a church service because I care. I don't care how long you've been going to church services because I care. I don't care how many doors you knocked on in your entire life. Yeah, you know where I'm going with this because I care. I don't care how many years you pedaled your bicycle through neighborhood after neighborhood because I care. I don't care if you only hold services on Saturday because I care. I don't care how many self-help books you wrote, many of those, because I care. I don't care how many spiritual conferences you spoke at because I care. I tell you the truth. If you get this wrong, none of these things matter. And there's people out there who are priding themselves, man, and just this, man, I got a list of the 10 top spiritists. Of course, one of the ones on that list is a guy by the name of Wayne Dyer, who is just this, he'll, he'll talk about Jesus. Boy, had me fooled there as a brand new Christian sitting in jail. And then I talked to Tim and asked him about, he says, you will be careful, bro. That guy's, uh, he's off, off, way off. I looked into it and he's way off. He's way off. So if you get this wrong, though, None of these things matter. If you do not truly know who Jesus Christ is, then you need to repent of your current idolatry. Yeah, current idolatry, because any worship outside of worshiping the true God is idolatry. You've created an idol, you've created something that is not biblical, and you worship it. And you need to repent of your idolatry, and you need to get on your face, and you need to cry out to the Lord, cry out to Jesus Christ, that he would pity you and have mercy on you and truly save you with a faith that is like no other. If you are deceived to believe anything other than what we talked about today, who Jesus Christ is, you need to repent. It is by grace through faith, and this is God's gift to those who will cry out to him in repentance. I can't make you do it. I wish I could. Boy, I sure do wish I could see more people come around, man, and know Jesus like, like he came to me and I got to know him. Wow, what amazing, how, how awesome is that? We need to cry out to him in repentance, especially in these times, especially the church. When's the last time you've heard of a church that repented? A church. I'm not talking about a couple people. I'm talking about a church. God, we repent. Forgive us of our being slack, forgive us of our being not alert like we should be, forgive us of our, our sloth and gluttony and our sins, God, forgive us. As your church, Jesus, forgive us. Next week is Resurrection Sunday, so we will be looking at the resurrection in light of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done on our behalf. Kind of cool how God works all things out together for good, doesn't it? We need to keep that in mind. We need to be praying for people. We need to be praying more than ever, Christians. We need to be seeking the Lord's face in everything. We need to cry out to him. We need to turn from our sins. We need to repent. And I'm speaking to myself included. I'm not exempt from any of this. And I can stand up here humbly and say, I need to repent and get back. Get back to that fire that I once had, that excitement that I once had for Jesus. I couldn't stay away from his word. I loved his word. I just loved praying, just spending time with him. We need to repent. Now's the time people need to see the church stand up, be bold, and shine the light of Christ in this dark and dying world. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, God, humbled, humbled by your word, God, humbled by who you are, Jesus, humbled by the consequences of those who do not truly know you, God. They will die in their sins. God, we have the truth of your word. We know who you are, Jesus. We know you personally. It's not just an empty confession. We are not professing or nominal Christians. We are not twice a year Christians, God. We are those who wake up in prayer, go to sleep in prayer, pray all throughout the day, seven times a day, God, or more. 
We praise you for your righteous ordinance, God. We are those who have been called out of this wicked world system, who have been changed, given a new hearts and new minds, God, new desires. You've given us the desires you want us to have in service to you, God. We are your people, Lord, but God, we have fallen so short like the one couple that went back on the front lines overseas because they came here and they were afraid they would get caught up in the American church. Oh, God, how far we have fallen. Wretched we are, God. That Sunday, the day we worship, has become the biggest day of idolatry. God, forgive us our sins. We repent. Forgive us of our fears and terrors. God, we know that you're sovereign over all things. Please be glorified in everything, even as you do with this coronavirus, God, that you get the glory in all things. Father, we pray for the church, that we would stand up, that we would wake up, that we would be bold. We pray for those who are in leadership, as the Bible tells us to do, God. Please continue to to give President Trump the boldness he needs in his administration, God, in, in, Lord, bringing about justice. We pray for another four years, God, and we pray that we will get serious in serving you this next time, today even, God. Please forgive us our sins. We come humbly before you. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right, I think we need to go out with one more time. Let's sing. No, but I figured something had happened. Yeah. yeah. I said, when this is all over, and she gets so, sick so easily, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's why Deb was going to be here too. But she's just not feeling 100%. And so, she, you know, we're, we're just being careful. We're not taking chances, you know, and that's what I would encourage anybody. If you don't feel good, please, by all means, you know, we want you to get better. We want you to. Um, you know, feel better, so, uh, let's see, uh, I think we should go out with, we preach Christ, we preach Christ.
only one who has the strength to say. The message we proclaim is the power of His name. We preach Christ. We preach Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I heard some harmonizing going on there, somewhere in there. It was good. Uh, Father, we just praise you, God, and we thank you so much for giving us your son, Jesus Christ, God, who died on the cross for our sins, God. This message of salvation through Christ and Christ alone, God, his works alone on the cross. There is none who is good, not even one. Every one of us falls short. We miss the mark. Our sin has separated us from you, God, for all eternity, unless we know Jesus Christ, unless we have come to a saving faith a saving belief in him. Father, we thank you that you've saved us through Jesus. God, we just ask now as we get ready to share a meal together, Lord, that you would just please bless the food to our bodies, God. Um, Father, please just bless this time of fellowship we have together as the church, your people, the body of Christ, and God, just be with everybody here. May this be our goal. We preach Christ. Amen. We have this moment, this time, just as the song says, Nobody knows what tomorrow may bring forth. God, we have now. Help us to be those witnesses for you in this lost and dying world, in this time, this time that you have given us. We love you and thank you. We pray all this in Christ's name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right.